بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وقف الصلوات وتم التسليمات عن قوت رحمة العالمين and then goes on that as a uh, condition of validity for the prayer there are obviously other conditions of validity but the one that we're going to have sort of a most uh, active relationship with in procuring it for ourselves is going to be the wudu or the tahara so even though it can contains um, aspects of uh, using water which physically cleanses things uh, the fact that it's done on particular body parts and in a particular manner means it's not really the water that is purifying but it is the ibadah itself so uh, most definitely in the maniki school uh wudu is seen as an act of worship in and of itself even though it's also a uh, a prerequisite or a condition of validity for the prayer as well and some of the ulama of teskia of spiritual purification they mentioned that one of the tips or one of the important things one should consider if they want to have a hudur or presence in their prayer is to have a presence in their wudu in their ritual purification beforehand so even though it's permissible to speak during the, the ritual purification during the wudu and to be distracted uh, unlike the prayer uh, you cannot speak obviously to anyone where you're praying however it's recommended and we'll get to this i think probably in the section that comes very soon um, that one uh, try to abstain from that and, and to try to focus as much as they can and then this inshallah will lead to a greater presence uh, or within the actual prayer itself so we have reached the section dealing with the fara'id al wudu or wudu in general uh, and so he divide, he's going to divide it into the integrals of wudu of obligatory actions then there's going to be certain sunan certain things that are considered to be uh, highly recommended to do that the Prophet Sallallahu always did then there's going to be something called fada'il or virtues of wudu that are also recommended um, but not in the same vein as a sunan however when we actually practically do the wudu we do it in an order that combines both fara'id and sunan that combines both obligatory acts and recommended acts so normally we would do everything however why would we want to know what is followed and what is not? Well, in case we have a paucity of water, in case we don't have actually enough water to do all of the uh, all of the sunnah acts as well, in, in addition to the obligatory acts, then this might be a case where we might leave out a sunnah. But generally speaking, we would not. Plus, plus nun fi wudu. So a section dealing with the obligatory acts of. Uh, Ablution or wudu. Fara'id al wudu saba. So the integrals or obligatory acts of wudu are seven. Other schools have as, as four, like the Hanafi school. Other schools, like the Shafi school, have six. We will see that the Malikiya have seven. They all agree that the four main body parts, which we'll go over in a second, all of them agree that that's a fard, that's obligatory, but then they differ about certain things after that. So the first one is the intention at the onset or at the outset in the beginning. That there should be an intention. And at the very least, that intention should be there at the first integral, which is going to be washing of the face. There are going to be things that are recommended that come before that, like washing the hands up into the wrist, and uh, rinsing the mouth, and uh, rinsing the nose. However, if you have the intention at the very beginning, even when washing the hands for the entire rule, you need not repeat the intention at the, the first integral or the first obligatory act. It suffices you to have it at the beginning. Uh, but that intention must be there and you must not sort of make another intention before you get to your face. That's what he means by And the wudu will not be affected if you um, 
lose sight of the intention after washing up the face. So you need a time it at the outset, practically the washing of the face. Generally, most people don't think about, do I still have my intention? Don't have my intention. I would not worry about all of that. Uh, just have the intention at the very beginning. In other words, that I am making this wudu. What's the difference between washing with intention without intention? Well, let's say you were outside and you um, working in the yard or in the garden or something and you just wanted to, to rinse off and you actually start to rinse off and you almost did pretty much the same acts that you do in the wudu. However, you didn't have the intention that you're making wudu. You had the intention of just rinsing off your, you know, the garden dirt and, and so forth. Then in this case, that doesn't suffice. You need to have the intention. So that's the first integral, the intention. In Amal Amal bin Niyat, as the hadith goes, uh, on the Prophet so I said, narrated by uh, Sayyidina Omar, that actions are by intention. وَغَسْلُ الْوَجْهِ مَا تَخْلِيلِ الْلِحْيَةِ الْخَفِيفَةِ The second one being, washing of the face. So here, the probably uh, indicative question be, well, what's the face? Or what are the parameters of the face? So they say that it's from Mamba to Shah, where hair normally would grow. In other words, um, right at the top of the forehead, over here. Normally, that's where hair would start to grow. So that would be the end of the face. And so that we can ensure that we get all of the face, then there should be a part of your hair up here that should also be washed. Because if we stop right at the hairline, then you may miss just maybe a little bit of the actual face, which is up into the hairline. So you get part of the hairline when you're washing the face. Uh, what if you don't have hair? If you shaved your head or you're actually balding in that place, um, then you know your, your hairline is not going to start back here it's still going to start over here but you would do it from the place where normally your hairline would be so a bald man doesn't have to make his face his whole head so it'd be over here in this area you know to, to kind of get it there and he should go with you know the place where he doesn't have any more doubt so at one time in his life he did have hair he kind of remembers where it was and, and so he should go a little bit beyond that just to make sure that you got the parameters of the face what about from um, uh, downwards, so from uh, from the vertical top, talking about the hairline, downwards here, there's a distinction between someone who has a beard and someone who doesn't have a beard. So someone who doesn't have a beard, which would be most women, if not all of them, uh, then their face would be where the jawline, this is called the, the effect, so you can't really see it from my beard, but this jawline here and this jawline here, where they meet, right? So where they meet, which would be right under the chin. So if you can see this point right here, right under the chin, because someone doesn't have a beard. That's where it ends at the, at the bottom. What about someone has a beard? The whole beard. So mine is a little bit longer. So when I have to, when I wash my face, I have to make sure that I get all the way to the last, the tip of the last hair on the chin, because that's going to be included in my face because my beard is attached to my face. So that would be the face. If someone has a beard down to here, then they actually have to get all the way down to whatever length of the beard is uh, in order to perform the wudu properly. Additionally, there's a distinction between a light beard and a heavy beard. What's the difference? How do we define light beard and heavy beard? Light beard is one where the skin, can, the skin can be seen through. So like five o'clock shadow, you know, stylish, sort of Miami Vice, Don Johnson sort of type of, uh, you know, stubble, then that would be considered a light beard. And in that case, then you would have to actually, the water has to reach the skin and there has to be what's called takhleel. Takhleel means that you're running the water in between the, the, the beard itself. So if it's like stubble or very light, then you have to actually make sure that the water is penetrating. And this is done by takhleel, what he describes here as takhleel. Takhleel al al khafifa. So getting your fingers in between and running the fingers in between the, the strands of the beard so that the water reaches the skin. 
In the case of a heavier beard like mine, I need not have, I don't need to have the water penetrate the skin. So I just need to make sure that the water reaches the whole surface of the beard in order for the wudu to be valid. And that includes, um, you know, the mustache, and it includes everything that is visible on, from the face. So eyebrows and um, eyelids. And then if you have wrinkles in your forehead, then to try to, or, you know, in, in, in the face and so forth, try to get in between. Again, the idea is not to be obsessive about it. Uh, one should you know, think of it like a what's, what's the thing, but you want to do it in a way that, you know, you do it thoroughly enough that you've kind of covered all of those, those aspects. And then from side to side is from ear to ear. So from here, right where the, the whiteness starts over here, between the, between the beard and the ear, and then also the same side. So that is the size, or that is the parameters of the face. Um, additionally, the manner by which we go and wash the face, right? A, a common mistake that's mentioned in other books is people sometimes they take the water and they splash their face, which is wrong. What they should do is you have both hands, if you're under a sink or you, you're getting from a vessel, both hands like this, you bring the water to the top of the forehead over here. So you're bringing it over here, you're not doing this. You bring it over here, and then you want the water to trickle down the length of, of the face. How do you do that? One of the integrals we didn't get to is called the delk, which is to rub. So Imam Malik understood washing. You know, he didn't say that, you know, you put your hand in, in, in a bucket of water and pull it out again, that you wash your hand. Washing means rubbing, right? Like you'd wash a garment, a feck, right? Or a dent. So with the face, you bring the water here to the top, and then you're going to lightly rub like this. And then for a man, he has to make sure he gets the length of the beard. The integral number is one, right? If you don't get it on the first time, then the second time you have to. And then if you go around the second, then the third, but don't go above three. If you get it on the first time, then the second and third times are similar. So that's the face. I'm going to leave this off because we're going to do the hair in a little bit. غَسْلُ الْيَدَيْنِ إِنَ الْمِرْفَطَيْنِ مَا تَخْلِيلْ أَصَابِعْهِمَا then the washing, the second or the third integral of wudu out of seven, is the washing of the arms. Another common mistake people do is they think their arm starts from their wrists because they washed their hands in the beginning. But in yet the lugat al arabiya tahtawi or tashmal al asabi' ila al mirfaq. So one of the meanings of yet and the one that's intended in the Quran according to the Malikiyah is that the, the, the yet or the arm is from the tip of your longest finger, which is your middle finger, all the way up to including the elbow. So remember how we said you have to get a little piece of the hairline here in order to wash the whole face. So it is up to and including the elbow. That means one should go a little bit beyond the elbow so that they got the whole arm. And also, there has to be تخليل الأصابع. So remember we said تخليل, which is putting your fingers through your beard, if you have a beard. This also has to be done with the arm to get what? In between the fingers. One, two, three, four. So you got those four gaps between the fingers. Those also have to be washed. So typically, if you're washing your right hand first, you have the water. You start with your fingertips. That's the sunnah. And then you're going to do تخليل. Right, so I get in between, and then you're going to wash the top and the bottom, you know, both on the top side and the underside of your arm, and you want to go a little bit beyond the elbow, both arms. So the sun is to do the right before the left. What if I'm wearing a ring? Do I have to remove the ring? The manicure say no. If it is a permissible ring to wear, so for women it would be gold or whatever the ring is. For a man, it would be a loan or a sole silver ring, not weighing more than two and a half grams, as we said earlier. Then that would be the permissible ring that one can wear, and you need not remove it. 
If you're wearing multiple rings and call it another school of thought, then remove the multiple rings because you're only allowed to have one ring. If you feel more comfortable removing the ring entirely, that's okay too. But it's not necessary to remove the ring according to the medical school. If you have a watch, you should remove the watch. Women who are wearing uh, rings or bracelets need not remove them. Uh, if the bracelets are obviously loose, then the water is going to get underneath anyway, so that's okay. What about the million dollar question everybody asks about? Nail polish. Dun, 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 nail polish. So, nail polish um, prevents water from reaching the nail tips, the nail itself. And water running over this nail is obligatory. So if you had tar, um, if you played uh, a little prank on your brother or your sister and you put crazy glue, you know, on their seat or something, and then, uh-oh, it got all over my fingers and my nails, and that crazy glue prevents the water from reaching, then you better get some nail pol polish remover or something to get it off. Uh, that's why tattoos are also problematic, because they cover the surface of the skin and then prevent the water from reaching the skin. If you have tattoos for whatever reason, and I know they're very expensive to remove, then this is considered a hardship. So we make remove normally. Um, however, generally speaking, we'd say anything that would be uh, on the surface of the skin that's going to prevent it from reaching, then that's problematic. Uh, females use henna, for example, that's not an issue because it doesn't actually cover from, it's not a layer on top of the surface of the skin. So, Anything then that's a barrier from the wedge, as well as the face as well, right? So anything that's, that's a barrier on the face or any of the body parts that needs to be washed has to be removed. So that's the uh, arms, including hands. And wiping the entire head. So in the Maliki school, it's obligatory to wipe the entire head. Other schools, uh, Shafi school, part of the hair, uh, the Hanafi say in Nalsia, which is like four fingers worth, but the Maliki school says the entire head. So basically the way we would do it, we would start at the same point that we started washing the face. But now we're gonna start from this way. And now it's wiping, not washing. So whenever we wipe, there's no rubbing back and forth. So it's basically getting your hands wet. So you don't have to cup your hands with water and bring it here, that's, that's washing. So your hands are wet. You start off like this, and then you're taking all the way back like this. That's wiping the entire head. Well, what if you have long hair? Then the length of the hair as well. So if one has long hair, let's say it went to my shoulders, then I do, you know, the length of that hair from the surface, one back like this. That is the obligatory part. The sunnah part, as we'll see, is to come back this way. But the obligatory part is to go all of it. What if you're bald? Just do the place where it is. So obviously you don't have hair extending, so you just do normally where the hair would be, so kind of like to the base of the neck. And starting up normally where your hairline would begin, and then going down to um, the base of the neck. What if your hair is in braids? If your hair is in tight braids, you need not remove them. Uh, unless you have them braided with um, cloth or, 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 or you know something that's on top of the surface of the hair. If it's so much that it's covering most of the hair, like over half of it, then you should remove them. However, if it's braided within itself, you know, sort of like African style of braids or braided without using uh, some sort of material, then you could leave the braids in. And then you just, you're wiping the hair and you're coming back. And they actually mention for men or women, whether the man's hair is braided or the, or the female, the woman's hair is braided. Then they need not uh, undo the braids. So that's one, two, three, four. The fifth integral of wudu. غَسْلُ رِجْلَيْنِ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ وَيُنْدَبُ تَخْلِيلُ أَصَابِيَهِمَا Then washing right and left foot. So for the right and left foot, um, same thing as the arm, but you would start with the toes over here and then go all the way and make sure 
you get up and beyond the, the ankle. So the ankle is, to the, is like the elbow. This is where you have to reach at least, and then you have to go uh, above it a little bit and make sure you get the sole of the foot as well as the top of the foot. Do I have to do takhleel between the toes like I did between the fingers? Not obligatory, but recommended. So if you can do it, good. If you cannot, then that's okay. What if I can't put my foot up in the sink? Uh, it's not a condition for you to put your foot up in the sink. Whichever way that you can wash your feet, even if they're down on the floor, right? Even if it's like a foot basin or it's lower, then that's okay. If you have to step into the, the shower or the tub because you can't raise your foot to the sink, that's okay too. Uh, if you cannot reach at all to your feet, then uh, if you have someone who can do it for you, that's fine. If you don't have anyone who can do it for you, then you don't have to do it if you can't reach. Can't reach your feet. So it's always muqayyid bil qudra. It's always qualified by having the ability to do so. And when we get to tayabum, which is dry ablution, then we're going to go over some of the reasons uh, that you, you don't have to use wudu. And it's not just for lack of water. There can be other reasons too, dealing with sickness, where you can make tayabum instead of uh, instead of using water. What delk? which is the sixth integral, or imrarul yadi al al-udu. And the delk, as we said, is the washing, uh, which is to, as I said, rub. When do we have to do that? In all of the washed parts, washed body limbs. So what are the washed body limbs? Well, the face, so there's delk there, the arms, so there's delk on the two arms, and the feet. So each foot also has to be washed. Something that is rinsed, like the hair, the head in other words, there's no washing. So it's just going back and then like this. And then finally the seventh integral, al-mu'alaa. فَإِنْ فَرَقَهُ عَمْدًا وَطَالَ بَطَلْ وَنْفَرَقَهُ سَهْوًا أَوْ عَجْزًا بِلَا تَفْرِيطٍ وَبَنَا عَلَى الْفَوْرِ صَحْهِ The last one is called continuity. Or muwala, that each integral should follow the other without a big gap between them. So, like, that's not really, uh, you can't really imagine that unless you're interrupted in your wudu. So, let's say you're making your wudu, you had just, you know, wash the face, and then the phone rings, you're waiting for a phone call, and you go grab the phone, or you have a child and you have to tend to them, or someone rings the doorbell. Um, whatever the issue might be. So if you leave uh, the wudu for a period that's long, what's a long period? In as how long it would take for your, your limb to dry under normal conditions and, and, uh, uh, and, and under a healthy condition. So someone who has extremely dry skin, their skin will, will, will get dry faster than someone who doesn't. Uh, if you are in a very dry climate, then your skin will get drier much quicker than someone who's not in such a dry climate. So we're talking about sort of, you know, balanced conditions that the, the, the limb would normally dry. I, I don't think that would be any more than five, ten minutes, my estimation. You know, beyond ten minutes, then we're talking, you know, you do to something else, it's too late too. So he says here, and mu'alaf, in farraqahu amdan. Here the Hashia says he's a little bit less uh, less forgiving. He said between two and three minutes is when the limb would dry. I would say maybe up to five to six. I don't know. Two and three. But it should not be um, a long time. So if you did it purposefully and then your limb dried, then you have to start over again. So start from the beginning. However, if you did it and your limb normally would not have dried, right? So if you're in a very dry climate and after 30 seconds it dries, but then you start, renew, you do your do and you start, you know, we want to come back to where you left off, you can because you're in a very dry condition. So we're going to go by what are, I don't want to say normal conditions, but like, you know, uh, um, typical conditions. 
So if you come within two or three minutes, or three minutes, so forth, then you come back, you can pick up where you left off. So I just washed my face. I was like, okay, the next thing is my right arm. Then you go to your right arm and continue the wudu. This is if you left it purposefully and went to answer the phone or whatever it might be. When farraqahu sahwana wa ajzan bila tafritin wa bana ala al-fawri, sah. However, if you do it uh, forgetfully or because you're unable to, so forgetfully, um, you uh, were doing the wudu and then, you know, you just kind of forgot what you were doing. And then you went to do something else in the bathroom where you stepped out for a second. And then you go, wait a minute, I was making wudu. So if you, at, on the point of that realization, you come back immediately, you can, you can continue from where you left off. However, if you don't come back immediately at that point, and then now you know that you left your wudu, and then the two, three minutes expires, then you have to start from the beginning. Oh, ajzen. Or you're unable to complete it. What do you mean unable to complete it? Well, many people in Western countries are not used to this, or in, let's say the well-developed countries are not used to this, but sometimes the water turns off and you don't have water. You can have the, the, the faucet can actually be on and then you did your right arm and you're waiting for the left and water shut off. You know, they have water curfews in some countries and, uh, and sometimes, they, you know, or maybe there is a water main break, whatever it might be, so the water shut off. So this is called ajzen. You're unable to complete it. Then as soon as the water comes back, then you can complete it from the point where you left off. You have that option to do that. Well, bana al alfaw, right? Bana al alfaw means then you immediately, as soon as the water comes back, you're able to do it. Then you can uh, you can complete the wudu. So those are the integrals or the obligatory acts of wudu. Now he's going to move on to the sunnah or the recommended acts of wudu, which are highly recommended. So he says, غسل اليدين أولا إلى الكوعين خارج الإناء. So washing your اليدين أولا. So wash. The first thing to do is washing the hands up to the wrists. خارج الإناء. What is the إناء? It's the the vessel that you have set up in case you know you don't have a running faucet. Or the water did shut off, and then you started filling up buckets to use later on. Um, so now you have an ina. Now you have a vessel. Let's say you got some filth on your hands for whatever reason. Change your baby's diaper, you yourself, restroom, whatever it might be. If you were to put your hand inside, then you've contaminated the whole thing, right? Because remember how we said in the very first chapter, we talked about... Uh, that if a wa water is affected by najasa and one of its three properties changes, either its color, or taste, or its smell, then that's not usable. You can't use it for ibadah or or, uh, or, or, or or typical uses in Muhammadans. So in this case, um, you need to wash them before putting them inside the vessel. How do you do that? Well, you have to find a way to take some water out of the receptacle or the vessel and wash your hands with it and not put your hands inside. So maybe you get like a cup, something to scoop with, but not your hands. It might be somebody else's hands, right? If their hands are clean and yours are not, then maybe they're the ones who scoop for you and then you wash your hands first. So typically you'd wash both hands at the same time, either it's under a faucet or you're doing it outside of the vessel like this. And that's sunnah. Wal madmada. Madmada means to uh, rinse the mouth. That we would take also with the right hand and take up, scoop up, swirl it around, and then uh, expect for it. And we do that three times. And madmada. Wal istin shaq, wal istin thar. These are two words that uh, are talking about breathing or taking some water, a slight amount of water, up the nostrils, and then 
uh, lightly or gently um, releasing it. And again, this should be done gently. You know, gently. You go to some of the massages, and unfortunately, I don't know if this happens in the women's section, but in the men's section, you know, it sounds like you know the elephants are gathering up the lake to, you know. So it has to be done gently. And especially when one is fasting. Why when one is fasting especially? Because the, the airway here can lead to the throat, does lead to the throat. And if water goes down your throat, through your nose, then you've broken your fast. And if you, if you don't on purpose. So maybe you didn't mean to, but you did it so hard, and then it went down, uh, went down the throat, so that's breaking the fast. So they say to be especially careful, careful during Ramadan or when, it, when one is fasting. Um, but otherwise, it should be done gently. Uh, I don't think people should hear you two blocks over. That will kind of be the, the general uh, uh, litmus test if you're doing it gently or you're doing it in the right way. And that also that is three times. And then you kind of pinch the nose a little bit, so you take it up. And then gently, you know, from the bridge of the nose all the way down to the nostril, let it come out. So in the first one we talked about wiping the whole head. Like one time like this, this is what we call a rad coming back. So coming back the same way like that um, is the sunnah aspect. If you didn't get it right, or if you didn't get all of it the first time like this, then you have to come back the second time. Otherwise, you coming back the second time is a sunnah and it's not a, uh, it's not a fault. وَمَسْحُ الْأُذُنَيْنِ بَاطِنَهُمَا وَظَاهِرَهُمَا وَتَجْدِيلُ الْمَاءِ لَهُمَا so, wiping the ears, الظاهر, which is this part, والباطن, behind. And basically, it's wiping. So, you're wetting your hands, and you're wiping like this. وتجديد الماء لهما. And also, renewing using different water than you used for your head. Even though you can use the same water for your head. So, if I were, let's say I'm wiping my head, and then I go like this, and then come back, that's okay. But the superior thing to do, the more meritorious thing to do, is to wipe the whole head, and then you go and renew the water under the faucet or, or the bucket, and then wipe your ears once like that. What tertib, and also doing it in the order that we prescribed. So the fara'it to be done in the order. So, however, niyyah always has to be in the beginning. Intention all has to be getting. If you have the intention after one of the first intervals, you have to do it over. So we're talking about the, the, the limbs. So the face, then the arms, then the wiping of the head, then the feet in that order. And then the sunan within that order. So we begin with washing of the wrists, right? And then in madmada, and then istin with istin thar, then washing the face, then the right arm, then the left arm, then uh, wiping the head, then the ears, and then washing right and left foot. That would be the order. So with tertib, that's sunnah. فَإِن نَكَسَ وَطَالَ أَعَادَ مَا قَدَّمَهُ عَلْ مَحَلِّي فَقَدْ وَإِلَّا أَعَادَهُ وَمَا بَعْدَهُ إِسْتِنَانًا فَإِن نَكَسَ أو نَكَسَ عفوا فَإِن نَكَسَ In other words, you put something before, should have you split, switch the order. So instead of um, uh, washing your arms first, you wiped your head, and then you washed your arms. What do you do if you realize it? If the time period is long, then I go back and only redo the limb that I put out of order. That's all I have to do. I don't have to do the rest of it. Only the one that came out of order. So I wipe my head and then I wash my arms. Well, I should have washed my arms first then wash your arms, then you're done. That's if the long, if it's a long period of time and there was two or three minutes that elapsed. However, if it's not a long period of time, then you would repeat that thing, which is washing the arms and everything that came after it, if you're still there, if you're still in the wudu. Istinanin, right? All of this is sunnah. 
because we said the tertib, the order is sunnah. So let's say you go and, and you pray and you had wi wiped your head before you washed your arms. Then in this case, your prayer is valid. You need not uh, redress that in your wudu. You want to redress it for the next prayer, that's something else. But the prayer that you just did is valid. Because as we said, the order is only sunnah. The Shafi'i said the Shafi'i, the order is obligatory. So on their method, it would be a different story. But in the Maliki school, the order is merely, um, merely sunnah. So once again, if I, if I put something out of order and I walk away and the time period is long, I can come back and just redo the thing I put out of order. If the time period is short enough that the limb hasn't dried, then I redo that thing and everything that came after. I hope that's clear. وكذلك الحكم في من نسى عضوا وإلا إلا أن غسل المنسي فورا واجب إلا أن أن غسل المنسي فورا واجب. This is also true for someone who forgot a limb. You forgot, let's say an obligatory limb. The wudu is not valid. But now, is it a long time period or is it a short time period? If it is a long time period, then you go back and just do the thing you forgot. You don't have to do the rest of the wudu. So I did everything, but somehow I missed my left arm. Then I go away. I answer the phone. I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't do my left arm. I'm pretty sure I didn't do my left arm. Then in this case, you go back and just do your left arm and your wudu is complete. You don't have to do anything else. However, if I'm still in it, right, I get to my right foot and I say, wait a minute, did I do my left arm? I did not. Then I go back to my left arm and do everything that came after it again. So I did my left arm, then I'm going to wipe my head, then I'm going to do my ears and I'll do the so the criteria then is, is it a long period has elapsed or a short period? However, if I forgot a limb, as soon as I remember, I have to go back and do it. I should not let a long time pass. You know, as soon as I can get to water and I, and I can redo it, I should redo it. Otherwise, redo the whole thing. If I let a long time elapse and I had the opportunity to, to address it and I did not. If I forgot a limb and I prayed, your prayer is invalid. Because you left out something obligatory in the prayer, like washing one of the arms or one of the feet. So I'd have to redo the prayer. So I'd have to go back, make a rule, and redo the prayer. Those are the sunnah. Now we get to the fadah, you know, the virtues, which are things generally that are not right inside of the wudu, but they're kind of periphery to it. Well, fadah iluhu, the virtues, at tasmiyah which is to say Bismillah at the beginning. And the sound is through ways are just to say Bismillah, not even Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, just Bismillah. وَسَتْرُ aura And covering one's uh, nakedness. This is if you're by yourself. If you're not by yourself, you have to cover your aura. Right? So if you're in the bathroom and, you know, you just kind of have like, you know, you're, bare essentials on, then um, it's still better to have your aura covered while making wudu, because we said wudu is an act of worship, right? So it's always better to do that. If there's other people around who can't see you like that, then it's wajib, then it's obligatory to cover the aura. So that's the second thing. Taharatul mahal, to have the place where you're actually making the wudu to be pure, free of impurities. You might say, well, that's a given. I mean, you know, try to tidy the bathroom as much as we can. We have nice tile going and marble, and how would that get dirty? Well, that's not the case for everybody. In many places, the actual place where the restrooms are in Udu is the same place. And, you know, it might be like just they have a shower head or they have a, fa a faucet in the same place where people are relieving themselves. So it's better to have the Harat al-Mahal. But the Mahal, which is the place that you're making the Udu, where you're standing should also be should also be pure. It's not obligatory because maybe you're unable to do that. But what would happen is if you find yourself in such a place and you're standing in it and you don't have a choice, then remember that you have to wipe you're washing your feet the last thing. And then when you step off with your right foot and your left foot, make sure you don't step back into it. So that you don't, you know, if there's some najasa uh, and it comes back on you, then you've kind of defeated the purpose. So uh, 
You still have wudu, by the way, even if you get najasa on your foot. Because we said wudu is it's to take you out of the state of hadith. Hadith means ritual impurity because you actually use the restroom of bodily function. The najasa on the floor is khabath. Khabath is ritual filth, right? That doesn't take the, the, the ruling of you have to do wudu. If you touch it, all you have to do is remove it. That's why he says here, it's amongst the virtuous things and it's not an obligatory thing because even if you get najasa on you, after you make wudu, all you have to do is wash it off. Well, istiqbal, facing, we just said facing, facing what? Al-qibla, istiqbal al-qibla, if you can, right? If you're outside and you have the ability to face the qibla, then it's always better to face the qibla. Again, this is giving credibility, the idea it's an act of worship. وَتَثْلِيثُ الْمَخْسُولِ إِذَا عَمَّتِ الْأُولَى تَثْلِيثُ الْمَخْسُولِ إِذَا عَمَّتِ الْأُولَى is to uh, wash uh, three times if the first one suffices. If the first one suffices. If it doesn't suffice, then you have to do two and three. If it, in other words, I, I wash my arm, but I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't get up to the elbow. So then the second time I'm doing it, it was actually an obligatory one because I didn't get the whole elbow. So it's only going to be virtuous if the first one was done right. If the first one wasn't done right, then the second one may be obligatory as well. That's what it means. And paucity of water with isbagh, uh, yani doing it right. Ahmed, go get that book that I have upstairs. So I actually have something um, to show you. So paucity of water, mal isbagh. So this means using the least amount of water that you can use in as much as at the same time you're doing a complete wudu. Why? Even if you have a lot of water. So the idea is not that, that you know, there's a, a drought or that you don't have access to water. But the Prophet said to them, and I'll demonstrate to you in a second how much water he actually used, um, only used a little bit, but he did the most complete. You know, one of the, one of the, the issues with with, uh, with modern uh, plumbing is we have these faucets. And we turn the faucet on, and then we're kind of washing, and then the faucet's still running. So we're probably using twice as much water as we actually need to use. So the Prophet I said that he was able to do the wudu in mud or thalath am dead which is his hands outstretched like this. So this is from Mat'haf Dar al-Medina, which is a, uh, a museum in al-Medina. And there is a sana, kind of a chain of transmission, that this was, as you can see how big it is, this was the amount of water that the Prophet Sallallahu needed, only this much to make the wudu in. So we would fill something like this, which is the mud in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is his hands outstretched like this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was able to make wudu from this. And I think this is roughly about two or three cups. I have, if I, let's say about that much, three cups or so. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's not that much at all. And then for his ghusl, he would use like three or four of these maximum um, to make his ghusl. Of course, everybody's different and there are different body sizes and, uh, and so forth. But I would say, um, as a minimum, when you have the faucet on, you don't really need more than, you know, almost uh, a very light uh, stream, you know, or it could even be drops, to be honest with you, and you'll find that you'll have plenty of water to make it with. People have it on full blast, and, you know, the area where they made the looks like a swimming pool afterwards is, you know, um, maybe it's too much. So you just need enough in order to do a spaz of the Right? And isbad wudu means to do it the most complete way, but also realizing that the natural resources that we have at our disposal, like water and other things, are meant to be preserved. And part of the principle, whether we have much of it or we have little of it, is to preserve it and use only as much as we need. It. So it should be as a needed, uh, as, as needed basis only. 
So that's the other fadila. Then the next one, وَتَقْدِيمُ الْمَيَامِنْ عَلَى الْمَيَاسِرْ Right, what's mayamin and mayasir? To do the right side before the left and all of the things that we did, right? So we had the arms and the feet. So the right arm before the left arm, the right foot before the, the left foot. وَالْبَدْءُ بِبَقَدِّمِ الرَّأْسِ وَعَالِ الْأَعْضَاءِ وَالسِّوَاكِ And also beginning when we're washing the face, as we said, with the top of the head like this, and also wiping the hair. Technically, you could start back here, and you could start over here when you're washing, but start from this point in both places. Right, and also to begin with, um, you know, in terms of Allah here means starting with the fingertips or starting with the toes when you are uh, washing those limbs. And to say after you're finished, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وما جعلني من التوابين وجعلني من المتطهرين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. So these are different ahadith, but these are things that were narrated that the Prophet said after he completed his wudu. Say it one more time. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله والله ما جعلني من التوابين وجعلني من المتطهرين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. So those are the fadail and then we move on to those things that are makruh or those those things that are disliked. Which will be finished this section. يقرأ الكلام فيه إلى رد السلام. So as we said earlier, it's disliked or reprehensible. In other words, if you if you elect not to do this with intention, then um, you have a reward. So to speak during it to anyone except رد السلام, except to say as عليكم السلام to someone who says السلام عليكم. Why رد السلام? When رد السلام واجب. So to to greet someone else's السلام is obligatory. والذكر, right? And also ذكر. To make dhikr during wudu, there are some hadith that are mentioned in like Bidayat al Hidayah, Imam Ghazali, and so forth about dhikr uh, in different aspects or doing different limbs. None of those hadith, to my knowledge, are sound. So, most of our teachers, our ulama, told us the only dhikr we know is at the beginning and at the end, uh, in terms of dhikr al lisan. There, there may be some difference of opinion. Obviously, Imam Ghazali had his opinions, but certainly. Um, from the Medicare that I'm aware of, there's no particular dhikr that we do for each limb. However, dhikr al qalb, there's still the dhikr of the heart, which is always alive. So he says the the the, the dhikr he's talking about here, ka'ijabat al mu'addin wa dua. If you hear the adhan in the background while you're doing wudu, can you say after the mu'addin like we're supposed to? Yes, that's a type of dhikr that he says is okay. Or dua. Right, and I said, and I said, a dua. The thing that we know is that it comes after the the completion of the wudu. ومن الوارد أن مخفر لي ذنبي ووسع لي في داري وبارك لي في رزقي وقنعني بما رزق رزقتني ولا تفتني بما زويت عني. So again, he mentions these. Even the, the muhaqqaq here says there's nothing of it that's found in the hadith. But I would say if people want to say that, then it, it's better to say it after the wudu. Shurut al-Sihha, which are the conditions of validity for the wudu. We already mentioned these. Adam al hail in other words, there should be nothing on the surface of the skin that will prevent water from reaching the skin if it's a washed limb. Wal munafi. So munafi means that during the course of the wudu, you actually do something to nullify your wudu. Right, so, um, you know, uh, if you're in the shower and you're making wudu and then you know, feel like you got to relieve yourself, then you do that, then you lost your wudu. You can't just pick up where you left off. You have to begin from the beginning. So adam al-munafi is that throughout the whole course of the wudu, you're not doing anything to nullify the wudu. And then finally, when we mentioned this earlier also, what does uh, a state of ritual impurity prevent? What can you not do? As-salah, praying, any type of prayer. 
the ritual prayer that is, whether it's a sunnah prayer, whether it's an awafil, or awatib, sunnah al uh, salat al eid, any of those things, you need to be in a state of wudu. What tawaf? Tawaf al Kaaba. So circumambulate the Kaaba as part of Umrah or Hajj, uh, even if it's uh, a tawaf that's not part of the Umrah, like tawaf al Wida, like the last tawaf you do before you leave to go back home, the farewell tawaf. It's still a tawaf, so you have to have wudu during that. And touching the pages of the Mus'haf, except for the teacher or the student. So the teacher and the student uh, have, the, uh, have the dispensation, the ruqsa, to be able to touch the pages uh, without being in a state of wudu. So if like you're a Quran teacher and part of the students and you might do it all day, it might be a hardship to, to maintain that state of wudu. So the last thing I'll say is, one of the um, one of the blessings of wudu is to try to remain in a state of perpetual wudu, which means whenever you lose your wudu, that you renew your wudu once again. And this was the practice of some of the Sahaba, like Sayyidina Bilal, Ibn Rabah, anhu. And in fact, he would also do rakatay in wudu. After he would make wudu, he also prayed to rakaz that the Prophet that he approved of that. So. Um, as Zabruk mentions in the Nasih al Kafi, and I think maybe uh, 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 al Miskeen, he talks that being in a state of wudu um, uh, is very beneficial in, in that it puts you very close to ibadah. So if you feel like you know touching the pages of the Mus'haf and you're not a student, or you feel like offering some extra prayers, you're ready to do it. Right, because the nafs, the ego, well, I'm still going to go to the bathroom and the water is cold and I got to heat it up and you're going to get wet. So you, all these things kind of say, okay, just, you know, do it later. But if you renew your wudu every time that you lose it and you're in that state immediately, then you're that much closer to perform the wudu. And he also said that this uh, brings about the, uh, uh, a greater love of the angels for you. So we all have angels that accompany us all the time, which, who are called the hafadah, or the guardian angels, and there's at least 10 of them. And so they like to be around people who are in a state of wudu. They like to hum, right? The, the angels are pure creatures made of pure light, and so they like purity, and they like to be around people who are in a state of wudu. So um, you know, that, that's an added benefit as well. So it's a good practice to have and to try to institute if one, if one is able to do it. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد رسول الله أجمعين وعلى صحابه أجمعين سبحان الله ذكر ربنا عزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله يا رسول الله